Hello, everyone. I'm Ron Brownstein, a senior editor at The Atlantic. In the next hour, we're going to discuss one of the most important, timely topics I can think of, how to reform and possibly rebuild America's criminal justice system that has for too long been distorted by racial inequities. The path to substantial reform won't come, come easy. Just one barrier is the fact that public opinion among white Americans in particular, when it comes to issues of race, is notoriously fickle. And some of the support for reform evidence this summer, uh, following the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, uh, have already receded. But it's also clear that changes to our criminal justice system have acquired substantial momentum. And we're going to hear from attorneys and community organizers who are steeped in these issues, and we're looking forward to learning from their experiences. Before we get started, I want to thank the MacArthur Foundation Safety and Justice Challenge for the support of our journalism today and for their partnership in our long journey around the country exploring these issues over the last few years. I also want to remind our viewers that we want you to be part of the conversation, and you can do that by submitting your questions on the bottom of the screen using the chat function. We'll incorporate them into the conversation over the next hour. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our first panel. Here to help us tackle how we can address inequities in our justice system, please welcome Brittany K. Barnett, attorney and co-founder of the Buried Alive Project and author of what the Washington Post calls, and I quote, an engrossing new memoir, A Knock at Midnight, A Story of Hope, Justice, and Freedom. Also, my angel Cody, lead counsel of the a Decarceration Collective. Thank you both for joining us and good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Hi, Ron. Hey, guys. Thank you for being here. So let me start. You know, the sentencing project in a 2018 study found that about 5,000 people are serving life sentences without parole for nonviolent non -violent drug offenses. How did we get here? Why are so many people serving such lengthy, lengthy sentences? Has it been a primarily federal decision, state policy, both? Brittany, can I start with you? Yeah, I'll get started in... For me, it's mostly at on the federal level. We really don't see a lot of life without parole sentences handed down mm. on the state level. I started this work as a corporate lawyer. And so my angel was definitely deeply entrenched in the work as a litigator. And I know she probably saw a lot more on the federal level. My angel. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think what I would say is um, we got here because America is addicted to incarceration. And I think living in the time of the COVID pandemic, we've seen sort of mm -hmm. how um, America's failure to have a public health response to a crisis affects all of us. So back in the 1980s, when we had the growing drug epidemic, which was the public health crisis, uh, we responded ineffectually. And that's how we got here. So the addiction to incarceration today is part and parcel and an outgrowth um, of that response. So the way that we see that symptomatically in the courtroom as lawyers who stand with people uh, sentenced to life in prison is that uh, people are receiving trial taxes, right? So Ron, let's say you're charged with um, distributing drugs and you exercise your constitutional Sixth Amendment right to trial as you should and as you can. What happens is on the federal level, the prosecutor who's charged you may enhance or increase the penalties against you because you refuse to accept a plea. So many people think that you're, you're in prison because you committed a crime. You might be arrested because you committed a crime and you might be charged because you committed a crime, but your punishment can be the result of a number of factors. The offense yeah. you committed, whether you surrendered your trial rights, whether you refuse to cooperate and become a state's witness because you have safety concerns. Um, and so many of the ways that we got here is through uh, America's addiction to incarceration, prosecutorial addiction to plea bargaining, and requiring people to surrender constitutional rights that we all believe should be guaranteed to them. The underlying drug laws, can we talk about that? I mean, it, the, the sentencing project, again, half the people in federal prison are serving time for a drug offense. The number of people in state prisons serving time for drug offenses is up tenfold uh, since uh, 1980. Um, uh, again, uh, how did it, how does it get that big? We talked earlier about the length of the sentences. Now let's talk about the, the kind of the breadth of the net. How are so many people, uh, such a large percentage of the prison population, uh, uh, ensnared over drug issues? Yeah, I mean, I think it's three things. First, it's the, um, on the federal level, it was the abolition of parole in the 1980s mm -hmm. under the Anti-Drug Abuse and Controlled Substances Act and the Sentencing Reform Act, right, of 1984. So we abolish parole. So more people are spending greater sentences and more time in prison, right? 
Um, we also instituted a number of mandatory minimums, right? And so that sort of took away from judges the discretion to fashion a sentence that is sufficient but not greater than necessary given the person who's standing before them. So we're now rubber stamping sentences on people sort of mathematically. Um, and then what happened is we defunded uh, community health drug-based programs, right? And so that sort of creates the alchemy for a rising and now what is a, a, a overflowing prison system. You know, uh, uh, Brittany, one of the things that was, uh, figures I think that will surprise a lot of people is the number of women that are caught in this system. Uh, again, sentencing project data, over 6,000 women are current, currently serving life or virtual life sentences, meaning 50 or more years. Uh, it's actually been growing at a faster rate for women uh, than men in recent years. What do you attribute this, this increase to? Uh, what, what's driving this, uh, this shift in, in, the, in the population that's facing these, ex these extremely long sentences? Yeah, the underlying cause of it overall, Ron, especially for women, are socioeconomic conditions. And you're absolutely right. The number of women in prison is increasing so drastically. Women are the fastest growing number of incarcerated people. And where I am in the state of Texas, we incarcerate more women by sheer number than any other state mm. in the country. And over 80% of the women in prison in Texas are mothers. And this is an issue that's just near and dear to my heart because my mom was in prison. Yes. And so I know firsthand the devastation, you know, caused by mass incarceration. But when it's your mama, Ron, it's a primal wound. Yeah, can, can we stop there and talk that? Because we're, we, we, you know, we've, we started with a lot of statistics as we often do in conversations like this, but behind the statistics, there are families, uh, there are kids, there are parents. Um, how, can you talk about the personal impact of these sentences? I mean, how are they psychologically affecting your clients who feel in the phrase like they're buried alive? And what does that mean for their families? Yeah, for us, I want everyone listening to understand life without parole. That is the second most severe penalty permitted by law in America. It screams a person is beyond hope, beyond redemption, and it suffocates mass potential as it buries people alive. And this, you know, as we see with our, our clients, is devastating for the families because as I know, as my angel knows, she has direct experience as well. When one person goes to prison, the entire family goes to prison. And so the ripple effect of incarceration is devastating entire families and entire communities. Mm. All right, so now that we've sketched out the challenge, let's talk about how you responded to the challenge. You two joined forces in 2019 to create the 90 Days of Freedom campaign, freed 17 people in 90 days who have been sentenced to life in federal prison uh, without the possibility of parole for nonviolent drug offenses. It was historic. Brittany, talk a little bit about how, or, or either, my angel, how you two came together uh, how you found each other, uh, and how you kind of set out on that pathway of work. Well, you know, I would say we came together in Washington, D.C. because um, we actually met at a clemency event under the Obama administration mm. and just looked at each other and knew that we were sort of twin flames in the work, that we saw the work in the same way, and that we were both leaving our, you know, corporate careers to do that work. I had left... Um, corporate law to become a public defender in Chicago. And I know Brittany had left a very lucrative and successful career as a corporate lawyer to represent people um, who were banished to life sentences. And so that we met years ago. Um, after the First Step Act passed in December of 2018, um, we had already had a database of lifers. Like the work had already been done. Um, Questionnaires had already been sent to prison. We had a list of hundreds of names of people who were serving life in prison for drugs. Um, and so we knew that, you know, what we had been preparing for for years, it was time to press play. So one night we just, it was literally Ron, you know, we sent a text message to each other and we were mm. like, it was sort of like a dare because we're very competitive. And so we we're like, let's see how many people we can get free. Um, and that sort of started 
you know, we start winning cases all around the country, going into courtrooms where we had never practiced before, didn't know the judges, the judges didn't know us. We're calling clients and telling them we want to represent them and have like only days to finish their motions. Mm. Um, and so it sort of like snowballed and people, you know, we were just winning all these cases and winning release for people who had been permanently banished to life sentences. At some point, I think, we came up with the phrase 90 days of freedom, but honestly, Ron, that was just because we were like, at some point we need to stop, you know, it was yeah, like yeah. 120 um, days or 60 days. Are, are you finding that your experiences, I mean, are, are other attorneys around the country, you know, people who are sitting uh, in a corner office somewhere uh, with, a, with, you know, a very nice outfit on uh, you know, filing corporate papers, are you finding that more people are calling you saying, how do I do this? I definitely think we have linked arms with attorneys from across the spectrum um, in law firms, in public defenders offices and mm -hmm. federal defenders offices, because I think it's sort of a call to conscience for all of us, you know, to help and figure out ways in which we can get people out of prison. So I certainly am finding that. Let, let me let me ask you this, Brittany. I mean, the, now you two are teaming up again on something they call the third strike campaign. I'm in California where they passed third, you know, the, the three strikes law uh, originally. Uh, obviously, the 1994 crime bill took that uh, concept nationally. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about what you're doing? Um, how much of it is, is, is focused on individuals and how much of it is focused on changing laws, Brittany? Yes, you know, this is the third strike is something my angel spearheaded. And once I heard about it, I wanted to to tag on and support the core okay. and heart of it are the heartbeats, the people mm -hmm. who are impacted by these draconian third strike laws. But also we understand as lawyers that we need policy to change. We need the laws to change. As my angel mentioned, the First Step Act of 2018, while it is a first step, it's a very limited piece of legislation. And a lot of people don't realize that some of the sentencing reform provisions in the bill are not retroactive, including mm -hmm. changes made to the three strikes law. So we have people serving life sentences today under yesterday's drug laws. And that's what really stemmed and fueled the third strike campaign. Yeah, let, 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 me, let me zero in right there because I'm interested in how both of you grade, you know, as this conversation has gotten, uh, what, more concentrated and louder over roughly the last decade. I'm wondering how you grade both Presidents Obama and Trump on responding. Uh, to these questions. Um, uh, Brittany, I, I believe Alice Johnson is a client of yours. President Trump certainly has touted his decision to commute her sentence, but how do you assess his overall record? How do you assess what Obama achieved on this front? You know, well, President Obama had a historic clemency initiative that can't be denied. He commuted the sentences of, of more people than any modern day president. And so because of that, a lot of people are free today and enjoying their lives, but it even still could have went a step further. We mm -hmm. haven't seen that type of, of clemency power executed under this administration. And so I'm just hopeful that whoever is in power recognizes how unique the clemency tool is to really help get more people home to their families. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, I, I want to encourage the audience to use the chat function to submit questions if you if you want to be part of the conversation. Uh, my angel, can I ask you, looking more broadly, I mean, what is the most important lever for change going forward? Uh, is it national policy? Is it state policy? Is it decision by local prosecutors? And if the answer is a little bit of all of the above, which is uh, the, the single most important lever in your mind? I think that the single most important powerful lever is figuring out and crafting and being very intentional about what we're asking for and what we're mm. fighting for. Um, I have said very uh, publicly that I am not a criminal justice reform advocate. I think that um, if this were 1820 and the question was, you know, do you support slavery reform? No one would say I support reforming slavery. We supported abolishing slavery. Um, if this were 1920, no one would say they support segregation reform, but we've sort of mm. entered into this mm. sort of the language and narrative of reform when it comes to mass incarceration, which I think is very dangerous. Um, and I, you know, I caution the left to not sort of embrace that as the solution. So talk right? about the alternative. I mean, because, you know, I, you know, it is, but on that, I could say in the, if you look at the, the, the 19th century, there were in fact two strains. I mean, there was abolition. And there was what became the, the platform of the Republican Party that Abraham Lincoln won, which was 
a, a quarantine, basically pre pre preventing the spread of slavery to the territories. And you know, you might say that reform is the equivalent of that. You know, not disturbing the, the core of the system, but trying to just kind of you know reform and, and limit it. What is the equivalent? The sure. modern equivalent of, of something that goes beyond reform that would be the abolition position today. Right, and I think sort of embracing reform is, is look where that's gotten us. That's gotten us mass incarceration, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think that the the alternative is to create justice in America because it hasn't been born yet. And so, I do think that sort of the criminal justice reform language is sort of the left's version of making America great again. It's rooted in a mythical mm -hmm. time that has not existed for uh, Black, Brown, and Indigenous people of color in this country and therefore it's an erasure of our lived experiences in, with injustice in America. So yeah. the question is how do we create justice, not reform? And I, I feel like my work is to create justice in America and I leave it to my descendants to reform it. Yeah. Um, here's the way that works, right? Because I think what reform has done and Brittany and I have won freedom for 54 people sentenced to life in prison unfairly under America's drug laws. and and reform statutes and the First Step Act have helped bring that about. Um, but we also represent a man named Farrell Scott who's serving a mandatory life without parole sentence for marijuana. So we have to explain to him why people are getting out under unfair crack laws because that's reform. But for marijuana, which is largely you know, being decriminalized in many states, Mr. Scott is still buried alive, right? And so I think what we're getting is reform. We're getting what we ask for. So, you know, in many ways, reform arguably expands the unwarranted disparities that we see in sentencing while releasing people from prison. So I think that we need to shift the narrative and not focus entirely on um, if we're moving the needle based on how many people are getting out of prison, but if we're dismantling mass incarceration in whole. So talk about, can you talk about, I mean, obviously, I mean, there is the potential that in a few days, I guess there's an election coming up, as, as we may have noticed. Uh, it is possible that you will have a Democratic president, Democratic Senate, and Democratic House. Uh, and, and they have certainly had, broadly speaking, in the last few years, more interest in these, in these issues uh, than, than Republicans. What, would the mo what, would, what could be the most important things that a unified Democratic government in Washington could do and how optimistic are either of you that you will see those things, in fact, move forward? I would like to see the MORE Act passed. I want to see the descheduling and decriminalization of marijuana um, retroactively, right? And I think that's very, very important. I think we need to retroactively uh, lower the three strikes mandatory minimums from life. Um, and so I think we need to look at the system as a whole because, you know, going back to your question about grading the presidents, Ron, the fact of the matter is that the First Step Act, which was passed under President Trump, was really just a you know, plagiarized version of the Sentencing Reform and Corrections Act, which had bipartisan support, but um, at the time, Democrats didn't control the Senate, and so Mitch McConnell wouldn't bring it to the floor for a vote, right? right? Yeah. So I think it's very important to understand the work that we've done so that we don't keep spending our, spending our wills and recreating the same bills and passing them and having the same press conferences, and to think more broadly about how can we form a system that um, doesn't leave in it uh, disparities that are endemic. Uh, Brittany, can I ask you, I mean, you know, obviously, you know, we're, we're talking kind of uh, among people who accept the premise that the, the, the system needs to be reformed. Uh, there are uh, there are other voices and the Attorney General, William Barr, uh, you know, among them, who has basically attacked the entire uh, movement, uh, uh, you know, local prosecutors and so forth, uh, as essentially uh, endangering public safety. And I'm interested I mean, the, the, the construct there is that is that uh, either moving more people out of prison or not putting as many people in prison to begin with uh, uh, creates a tension with public safety, makes makes communities less safe. What's your experience? What, how would you respond to that if he was here on the other side of the of the Zoom? Yeah, these misguided appeals for law and order are just unhealthy. With the work that we do. We are freeing people that were set to die in prison. Our, our work is life saving. But it's not only saving the lives of our clients, it's also having a positive impact on their families and whomever they may positively impact in the future. The work that we do is crucial to freeing people 
who will live their lives in ways that will help shift this paradigm, shift this narrative about people who are incarcerated. I think there's this mm -hmm. just misperception or people just don't even really care about people who are behind bars. And with the work that we do and the book that I just finished, writing that book really gave me a chance to reflect over the work and to really see how my definition of freedom has evolved and realizing as my angel and I do that, we can't keep saving people from prison and sitting them back in poverty. And so my work as a social entrepreneur, I'm working to invest in formerly incarcerated people so that we can prove these misguided appeals for law and order wrong. You know, I'm working to invest in the genius that I've seen behind bars. Some of the most brilliant people I've ever met in my life have been my clients. And so I'm doing that through investments in their entrepreneurial spirits when they get out of prison, Ron, so that they can be in positions not just to survive, but to thrive. So, uh, you know, I, we, that, we, go ahead, my angel, did you want to add? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, your, your question about sort of the law and order um, refrain that we hear repeatedly, that's not what the Department of Justice is doing at the podium in courtrooms. They're giving cooperation coupons to people who might have um, longer criminal histories than our clients, right? And so they're saying to the American public that Farrell Scott being in prison makes you safer, but they're uh, asking judges to give lesser sentences to people who have dangerous backgrounds merely to reward them for cooperating and becoming state's evidence. So yeah. my response is, if the government, want, if prosecution, the Justice Department wants to build a system that makes people safe, then prosecute in ways that makes people safe. Um, you know, I, and in fact, my question was about one of the obstacles to this kind of rethinking. Dwight, one of our viewers, has another uh, question about a different obstacle. How do you suppose we address the power and influence of corporate prisons who have a financial incentive to keep mass incarcerated, who have a financial incentive to keep mass incarceration, to keep bodies in prison. I uh, would love to hear from either of you if you've had any uh, battles or encounters with them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think towards the end of um, the last administration, there was a policy, a Justice uh, Department policy to uh, deprivatize prisons and to certainly like cut some of those private contracts uh, under former Attorney General Sessions, that policy was abandoned. We've seen the explosion of privatized prisons. Prison is really expensive, right? And so for anything from the emails that our clients have to send to family, to us, the mail system, which we've seen the mail disrupted, mm -hmm. prisons themselves are really expensive. And so we're sort of at the place where we've reached a conflict of interest where we're uh, profiting off of the caging of human bodies and also uh, trying to reform uh, that system as well. And so I certainly think that privatized prisons, I've, I've had cases where, you know, someone sends an email. Uh, this, when I practice in the Northern District of Illinois, someone within the prison system sends an email and says, we have X number of beds available. And then I see probation officers starting to file um, revocation reports on people just to fill those mm. beds, mm. just to fill those beds. Mm. Um, and that goes to the bottom line of profiteering. Um, uh, can I ask, Brittany, I mean, uh, there have been uh, communities, we've seen prosecutors in some cases, uh, uh, raise the question of whether the COVID pandemic should change the discussion of how many people are in prison, who is in prison. Um, is, are you seeing any uh, impact from that, that concern in terms of advancing your decarceration efforts uh, and, and the overall questions of racial disparities in the system? I don't, but mm -hmm. there should be. You know, mm -hmm. COVID-19 is ravaging America's prisons. Prisons are a hot spot. Our clients don't have the privilege to socially distance. The masks that we're supposed to wear, that they're supposed to have, many of them do not even have them. And not only that, our clients have been on continuous lockdown in their cells, Ron, let out 20 mm -hmm. minutes a day since March. Prison mm -hmm. visits have been canceled. Programming within the prisons have been canceled. And so the psychological impact that COVID-19 is having on our clients is going to far outlast the pandemic. Um, the, uh, you know, another, I, 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 that, I mean, that's, that is a very daunting kind of vision. I mean, you know, you, you, you know, it wasn't, you're talking about a difficult situation getting 
significantly worse in terms of uh, the day-to-day -day, uh, experience. What, do, do you have a sense of the, of the health? Uh, I mean, how you, you said it was ravaging. I mean, it, how widespread are we seeing at this point uh, kind of outbreaks in the prison system? You know, I just one example um, that I know here in Florida is, you know, I had a client who contracted coronavirus um, here in Florida, hand sanitizer is considered to be contraband. And when they went through at this women's prison and tested the women there for the first time a month into the pandemic, half of the women prisoners were positive. So that's just one example. Question from YouTube. Um, I recognize and lament the disproportionate impact on minorities incarceration has had. Can an economic analysis structure applying the cost of incarceration uh, and the seriousness of crime drive change? I guess they're saying, can you make an argument that the, that the cost of keeping people in, in, in prison uh, ex could, be off, could be offset by the value of what they can, I think Brittany was saying before, what they could produce in the economy if they were, if they were not? Yeah, absolutely. And these are facts that are known. This country spends over $80 billion a year on incarceration. Mm. This is a, a known fact. And whether it's from a moral standpoint or an economic standpoint, you know, it is just both morally and fiscally irresponsible the way this country incarcerates people. And we're doing so in a way that is locking up the very ingenuity this nation needs to thrive. Mm -hmm. The human capital that is being wasted under these draconian sentences, or just sending people to prison in the first place who may not belong there. My mom had a drug addiction. She needed rehabilitation, not imprisonment. And unfortunately her crack addiction wasn't treated as a public health mm -hmm. crisis. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, I think we can definitely use the economic standpoint to show just the human capital that's being wasted. And those numbers are there. You know, yeah. you know, I, I, think it, angel, yeah. I think it's difficult to quantify the fiscal impact of incarceration, um, not only on those who are incarcerated, but the generation that is infected, their children, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. so what Brittany and I do is repair bloodlines. And what we know is that families, uh, their income increase when they have, when they're whole and complete, Taking one earner out of the family impacts that family for generations. It impacts life incomes and opportunities. And so I think I, I take the question um, to heart because it's a very good question. I just think it's very, very difficult to quantify the fiscal impact of mass incarceration. You know, let me ask you as a, as a kind of a final question. And Brittany, you know, you talked about your mother really, you know, it was a public health problem. Uh, the crack epidemic was framed as a crime problem. The opioid epidemic today uh, is framed much more as a public health problem. That's the way people talk about it uh, usually. I, I'm interested in that. I mean, you know, this is, this, is, this is a problem centered in small town, mostly white America. I, I, do you see a disparity, not only in the way it's talked about, but the way it's been treated in, in the criminal, uh, criminal law enforcement and criminal justice system? Oh, absolutely. I grew up in rural East Texas. So I saw that when the crack epidemic was at its height, just how it was criminalized and demonized. Mm -hmm. And I see now that opioids are ravaging the community and small town that I grew up, it is being treated rightfully so as a public health crisis, but so was the crack ep epidemic. And so now we have generations of people who are still incarcerated <laughs> because of this criminalization of crack co cocaine. And that is problematic, problematic. And so as we're taking this, this second look and reframing public health with opioids, we, we can't forget about the victims of the war on drugs from the crack epidemic. Uh, my answer, let me, let me ask the last question to you because I mean, you, you said something before, you know, President Obama, when he was in office, often talked about changing policy as a relay race. You know, you take it as far as you can and you hand the baton to the next person. I felt like you were saying that that may be insufficient, that there may be, in fact, the opportunity for more fundamental change uh, in your lifetime. Um, what, is, what is your sense of how far uh, it is possible for the country to go in reimagining what public safety, what criminal, what criminal justice system looks like? You know, I think it is as far as our imagination takes us quite honestly. Um, and I look at the women's movement and the women's suffrage movement. And I, I think that we are at a time of poetic momentum 
And that is why I'm always, every time I'm on a panel, I am encouraging us to re-envision and to really think about every piece of the system. Um, because, you know, so many of us are engaged. So many of us are paying attention. And I think that's a beautiful thing. I've stood mm. in courtrooms many times and felt alone with my client. Like, mm. you know, America was not paying attention. And so I think that it will go as far as our imagination will take us. I think that it's time that we... Um, uh, held up the entire system to the light and looked at where it was refracting and what areas need to be fixed. Um, certainly mandatory minimums, certainly formulaic sentences, uh, decriminalizing marijuana, doing all of this retroactively and making sure that we hold uh, our public servants accountable is very, very crucial to that. And then increasing decarcerating people for when they come out so that they're not arrested by poverty when they are released from prison. Well, to use your word, I think that was a poetic way to, to, to wrap us up. I, I want to thank, we have to leave it there. I really could keep talking to both of you all, and I'm sure the audience could all have to. We're going to have to leave it there. Thank you for joining me. And uh, now we're going to turn to our next conversation. Thank you both again. Thanks, Ron. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, I'd like to bring into the conversation two organizations that are working to end mass incarceration by addressing some of the root causes poverty, racism, unequal access to resources, and the criminal justice system. P please welcome Amanda, Amanda Alexander, the founding executive director of the Detroit Justice Center, and Deanna Van Buren, founder and executive director of Designing Justice and Designing Spaces. Uh, welcome both. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, thank you for having us. Oh uh, yeah. So many of the recent conversations around criminal justice have been hyper-focused on the role of policing. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, for, for obvious reasons over the past years. We know that's just one part, part of overhauling uh, the way the entire structure works. Can you tell us a little bit about your work and how you're extending beyond the issue of policing to rethink the criminal justice system? Amanda, can I go to you first? Sure, yeah, so at the Detroit Justice Center, we are attorneys who work with people who are trying to stay out of jail and prison. Uh, people who are caught up in these cycles of having a suspended driver's license, which means that they um, you know, need to drive to work still and end up with fines, fees, tickets, warrants for their arrest and jail time. So we're trying to remove legal barriers and help people stay out of jail and prison, maintain their rights to their children, uh, keep stable housing. But beyond that, a, lot, a big part of our work is to focus not just on what we're tearing down, but what we need to build up mm. in order to make sure that Detroit and other cities can thrive. So for a long time, long before this summer, long before the defund police conversation really got traction, Detroiters have been saying, why on earth are we spending half a billion dollars on building a new jail in this city? Why are we spending over $300 million a year on the police, when at the same time, there are people living without running water in this city. You have teachers and students complaining of black mold and rats in the mm -hmm. schools. We have an ongoing crisis around affordable housing. And so these are the you know, fundamental issues of you know, priorities. We communicate to young people in Detroit every single day how invested we are in their future. Um, and for a long time, we have communicated to them that we are more invested in policing, prosecuting, and caging Black people in this city than actually figuring out what they need to thrive. Mm, thank you. Uh, Deanna, you know, my angel in the last, uh, if you might have heard her final answer, was saying we're kind of limited only by our imagination. And you have certainly kind of camped out the boundaries of imagination with a very popular TED Talk called What a World Without Prisons could look like. I, I think a lot of people in the audience would like to hear what that might look like. Do you think it's possible over some time period to literally eliminate all prisons or what do you have in mind? We do. At Designing Justice, Designing Spaces, we're both real estate developers and architects. And the idea is to really build and imagine the infrastructure to end mass incarceration by really attacking it at its root causes. And Amanda sort of outlined, right, this disinvestment that's happened. And, you know, I'm an architect, right? So I'm, I'm an artist, you know, I, I believe that creative practice really opens us up into elastic thinking, right? It, it does something to our brain chemistry that we're really able to come up with new ideas. And that's what we need, right? We're not making the prison better looking. These are new places, these are new prototypes and there, there are tons of them, right? I've got 30 prototypes on the table that have to get imagined and developed. And this is coming from community. I don't sit in a room coming up with this by myself, right? 
We worked with lots of folks to really engage creatively on what these should be, including Amanda and her group and youth and, and elders and systems impacted people and their families. I mean, anybody can do uh, it. Yeah, let me ask you this. Is there one project that you've done already that you've actually executed that most completely embodies the philosophy you want to bring to the criminal justice system? I think you may have some slides that, that, that could, could help us, but, but I'd be interested in, in, in how you have executed this vision already. Sure, sure, sure. We can talk a little bit about that. And I feel like the project that I'd like to share is one that we're working on with Amanda. Okay. And it's, it's emergent, right? So in terms of things we've executed already, um, it's, it's a long game to build infrastructure, right? It takes time. And so when we look at what we build instead of this stuff, it's like you have to keep the tenacity going and really push and help people understand. So whether it be a school on wheels, whether it be like repurposing criminal justice infrastructure, the working with folks to really imagine what this stuff needs to be is the step one. And that can take some time because you have to work at the speed of trust, right? I think I learned that from Amanda <laughs> very well. And the project that we're working on is in these buckets of work, right? These are the three areas we think we need to do to unbuild racism and end mass incarceration, starting with restorative reinvestments in community. And so the Love Campus is a project that we're doing to social justice campus in Detroit on East Grand River, uh, about three quarters of a mile from downtown Detroit. We do think we're essential workers, by the way. So you see me in a mask on site very safely. Mm -hmm. Unbuilding racism can't stop. Um, and we will be purchasing these lots to develop this campus. And it's starting with the love building, right? This is where Amanda's gonna live and do her amazing work. And it's really a catalyst, right? The way that community organizers are coming together to create catalyst, catalytic real estate development, allied media projects, Detroit Disability Power, Amanda, Detroit Justice Center, Detroit Community Technology Project. And they're, they're bought the building. They're gonna occupy this building. And what you're looking at is a space for social cohesion, right? A place where people can come, they can collaborate, they can be together. This is what keeps our community safe, right? The, the, the building of infrastructure that supports meaningful, healthy relationships through social cohesion is so valuable, right? And we don't have it, right? We have these disgusting spaces where people are living, they're, you know, they don't have access to resources. This will provide access to resources and the environments that are trauma informed and allow people really to come together uh, and build community. It'll be beautiful. And it started construction last month, right? Wow. It's it's on and cracking. It's happening. Well, well listen to you, Deanna, I am reminded that uh, that if I was not, had not spent my life as an ink stained wretch in journalism, an architect is what I would have wanted to to be. Uh, Amanda, can I, can I ask you to talk a little bit about how you see this campus, this building, um, creating opportunities? I mean, what what will be different by bringing together these different organizations in one place? Yeah, so I think it's a powerful thing that this is just a few blocks away from uh, the parole office in Detroit. So we will be able to welcome back our clients who are coming back from periods of incarceration and to be able to offer them legal services right here, mm. saying, you know, do you need help getting ID? Do you need help clearing child support debt that accrued while you're inside? Whatever it is gonna take for you to be able to stay out. And while they're there, there's also going to be um, you know, spaces for healthy vegan food. Um, we have um, Paradise Natural Foods will be here. They're one of the biggest feeders of the movement here in Detroit. Um, there's all sorts of organizations. Detroit Disability Power is helping us think deeply about the intersection between disability justice and criminal justice. And we'll really be able to, um, you know, have more synergies across the work that these organizations are doing. It's also been important to us to have a process of listening to the local residents in this neighborhood um, to make sure that this building and this campus is really going to be what they need in order to feel like they're living in a neighborhood where we are taking care of each other, where we are creating safety together in a way that does not rely on police and jails. And I should say that our um, partnership with Deanna started a couple of years ago now. So we partnered on a youth design summit in 2018. And we asked young people in the city of Detroit, 13 to 18 years old, how could we spend this $533 million that the county is trying to spend on a new jail and youth jail? Mm. How could we spend that in a way that would make you feel safe and valued and empowered? 
and not a single young person said we need more jails or more police. Yeah. So they, they had so many ideas. They said, you know, build a mental health spa. This is a place where you could go to talk through whatever was making you anxious. Mm -hmm. um, these young people had designed it down to what would be the most soothing paint colors on the walls. Wow. They said, pay our teachers, build affordable, accessible housing, build transit that will get us from one side of the city to the other. And these are the types of things that keep communities safe. You know, the safest communities are not those with the most police officers or most jails. It's the ones with abundant resources, intergenerational wealth. And that's what those young people knew. They knew that we didn't need to keep investing in you know, disposing of people, um, but instead really equipping people with what they need to be in healthy community. You know, I, 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 to follow up on that, that kind of that, that vision at the end, Danny, you, you, you alluded to the idea of restorative economics, restorative justice. Um, can you explain those concepts a little bit uh, for, for the audience and, uh, and how they lead to kind of changing the prism or changing the perspective on, on uh, what reform looks like? Sure. Like? Yeah, we, we really started early on with the idea that we need to build for restorative justice. Restorative justice being a philosophy that says when there's been um, harm done, a crime, harm done to folks, that the needs of the survivors are most critical mm -hmm. and that those who've committed the offense are accountable for that and should be given the opportunity to make amends and these can come together, right? It's a more of a repair approach to, to justice and begin to address the offender's conduct and move forward, right? Repair that breach. So what does that look like, right? We know what punishment looks like. When I tell you what justice looks like, you think of prison, a courthouse, what is restorative justice? physically look like and feel like. And we started to make those spaces because when you make them, right, you amplify and foment the practice. We've been able to see how our environments, both the Syracuse Peacemaking Center, which is a project we finished a couple years ago and Restore Oakland in Oakland, California, will do the same in Detroit, right? At the Detroit Love Campus, we'll also have space for restorative justice. It allows them to increase the caseload, right? It allows mm. people choose restorative justice when they walk into our spaces, right? It's a choice. You don't have to do it. Mm -hmm. We can start to divert. We just want to divert, right? So people don't touch the system at all. And this is one programmatic, philosophical, and spatial approach to doing that. The restorative economics is also critical. People need jobs, right? And people need to own some stuff, right? Allied Media Projects owns the love building. We're going to own that and we're going to do mm. crowdsource funding so the community can have an equity stake in the project. So it's both workforce, it's ownership, right? So the economics comes into it every single time. People need people need some money and resources. I was wondering about the, I mean, how are you, how are you financing a project of this magnitude? I mean, what, what, what is, and is it replicable? Is it, is, is this something unique or is this something that you can do in, in, you know, Dallas and Atlanta? Sure. You could do it anywhere. I mean, it's, it's, we always build prototypes, right? So it's the first time we're going to try crowdsource funding at the scale has never been done before. This mix of uses may never have been done this way before. This process might be new, but we package it. We're like, you do it, right? We want to replicate it over and over and over again. It can be done anywhere. Financing is coming from all kinds of places and we're at a good time, right? We're at a good time where money is flowing into black and brown communities for this kind of infrastructure, philanthropy. We've got social impact investors. We have community oriented lenders, uh, the crowdsource piece, right? Like I'm gonna put some money into this project and you stack this up in order to be able to finance it. And we've been pretty successful in supporting groups in mm -hmm. doing so. Amanda, let me let me go back to something you, you mentioned a few minutes ago, um, which was about police budgets, because clearly the phrase defunding the police has become a lightning rod uh, in in the presidential race and in and in communities. Uh, Joe Biden, you know, kind of does not embrace uh, the phrase. Uh, the, the, certainly uh, critics argue that, you know, that that means less police equals more crime. Uh, two questions here. Um, is that the right phrase that accurately captures what you think needs to be done? Uh, and how would you describe the process of rethinking the way we produce more public safety, which theoretically should be the goal of whatever you're spending in this area, as opposed to simply uh, increasing the size of the police force? 
Sure. So I think defund police is the um, you know, word that is coming out of movements. It's the word that is important to people who are putting their bodies on the line in the streets. Um, you know, defund police, abolish the police. Um, I think that these are powerful frameworks, but of course they take some more um, explanation. You know, I mean, I think that you know, it, these have always been demands that pair divesting from the carceral state and reinvesting in social welfare, in healthcare, in education. And so it's always a twin divest invest approach. Um, and we, you know, these are not new demands. Uh, the movement for black lives and others have made these types of projects that Deanna and I are talking about, they have made them possible in the last several years. So before we ever get to the point of being able to imagine new infrastructure, it has been community organizers in their communities taking on very big fights. Um, so I know Deanna has been very active in Atlanta, for example, where they have shut down the city detention center. But that yeah. was after many years of organizers fighting against cash bail, getting ICE um, you know, out of uh, the, the city, um, getting city ordinances off of the books that criminalized poverty. And what they were able to do over the course of several years in campaigns was to get the local city jail population down from over 1,000 to less than 100 people. Mm -hmm. And then after that organizing victory, they were able to call on Deanna's team to say, how do we yeah. um, repurpose this from a jail into a center for wellness and freedom? Um, so, so all that to say, these are very local fights around budgets, around police contracts, and you know, always saying, okay, now that we've divested, what do we invest in? Uh, can, I, can I just follow up there? Because certainly we know that every community wants safety. I mean, you know, it isn't like white suburbanites are the only ones who want to feel safe walking down the street. We know that low income uh, communities want safety. We know working communities, everybody wants safety. Um, what is the... Uh, you, you have, as, as we were talking about in the last panel, you know, you have uh, the attorney general saying that these two goals are intention, that uh, more reform, fewer people in prison means less safety. What's the, is there, a, is there a flaw in that logic? Is there a break in that logic? I mean, do you, can you increase safety while reducing the amount of, mud, uh, of, of budget that goes toward a kind of, uh, you know, a, um, a, crime, a criminal enforcement? Uh, we have to, yeah. I think um, the evidence is very clear that um, you know jails produce less safety. Um, you know, you know, people are you know jails contribute to poverty, to economic churn, to um, homelessness, to children entering the foster care system. Um, you know, as mentioned earlier, that eighty billion dollars is spent on the prison system, but then when you total up the actual cost on the economy, it's one point two trillion dollars mm. because that takes into account all of the impacts. Uh, you know, when it comes to housing, uh, the foster care system, um, you know, needing to retrain people for jobs, all sorts of things. And so, um, you know, absolutely, I think that we have been deeply invested in so many communities' demise. Um, and in many cases, the only investment that people have seen has been in policing and incarceration. Yeah. So this is really a conversation about how do we finally reinvest in what people actually need and what keeps us safe? Um, because what we have invested in has actually produced unsafety. Well, let me ask a question from you two for both of you, maybe Deanna to start. Um, what is the role of philanthropy in this, in improving public safety and rethinking policing? What can funders do to drive this, uh, drive this conversation? I love this question, Ram, because I, I talk to philanthropy about this all the time. On the infrastructure side, we need philanthropy to come in and pay for pre-development costs on these restorative assets. We need them to take a first loss on this, right? They come in with the risk capital so we can get other investors and other groups to come in. And that is a very powerful, simple thing that they can do. And I think they're starting to. They're starting to get it and they need to come together. They need to work together on three needs to come together and really create these investment funds that invest in community capital works not you can't just pay for the programming right you also have to build the infrastructure to support that programming and it's very costly so that's, that's the where hardest the, dollar right that's always the yeah, hardest dollar this is a hard dollar to raid the pre-development dollars is really hard to get that first amount of money in that will make an investor feel comfortable that'll make a government entity feel comfortable uh is really powerful 
Hey, uh, Amanda, this might be this might be more for you. A question from YouTube, and and one that I think a lot of people around America are asking as we head into these last few days. Do you have any concerns from the field uh, for the field given the upcoming election? Do you expect civil unrest uh, in the aftermath in, in in a place like Detroit? Uh, so that's one part. Can I answer that on the phone? Yeah, you bet. You bet. Oh, yeah, I'll answer both. Um, but so um, I think like Deanna is saying, there is a really important role for us to be able to pilot and demonstrate things that work mm. and ultimately make the case for things that should be public investments. So in Detroit, we are working with a hospital-based violence intervention program called Detroit Life is Valuable Every Day. And what they have found is that when you address the underlying social determinants of health, you can actually interrupt cycles of violence and incarceration. So we are working with young people who are being discharged from the hospital with gunshot wounds. And if we are not meeting their need for housing and for employment mm -hmm. and other things like that, it's very likely that they will be re-injured. Um, but what we have found is that by meeting some of these social determinants of health, we can interrupt those cycles. So we're working now to create supportive housing for young people who are coming out of the hospital, healing from gun violence, to be able to heal safely. And this is the type of thing that if we can demonstrate that this works, then this is a public health-based, housing-based solution mm -hmm. to interrupting cycles of violence that then we could tee up for you know, public housing and public health funding. Um, so, so you know, that is uh, the type of, of role that philanthropy can play is helping us demonstrate that these things work. Um, Let's table the, the, the unrest question for me because there's a follow-up I'd like to ask you right there. Um, uh, you know, I covered the crime bill in the 90s living, living in DC. And at that point, uh, there was a broad support among uh, mayors and other municipal officials, including a letter from every major black mayor in the country supporting the bill. I mean, there was there was a vision in the 90s uh, uh, broadly among local officials that, you know, the the way to deal with the what was happening with 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 the crack epidemic was, in fact, more policing, more more enforcement. Um, I'm wondering how much that's changed now. I mean, as you deal with you talked about the county wanting to spend 500 million on a on a on a, on a prison. But as you deal with local officials uh, and, and Deanna, as you do in many cities, do you see a shift not only among activists, but among mayors, city council presidents, uh, those kinds of decision makers? I think that people are forcing a shift. I think, you know, there is still uh, particularly a generational divide. Mm. Um, you know, here in Detroit, the mayor will say, you know, people keep asking me to send in more cops. They say that yeah. they want more police. And I'm like, wait, listen to what people are actually asking for. They're saying we want to be safe. And yet the thing that has been an offer the past several decades has been, well, if you wanna be safe and you must be saying that you want more police. But mm -hmm. as soon as you ask people the follow up question about what they mean by that, as we have been doing with Deanna's team, then you get these much broader answers about actually, <laughs> you told us that we could have police, but what we want is great schools. Uh -huh. What we want is mental health supports. Um, so it's about creating space for those richer conversations um, to, be, to be had. Deanna, how about you in, in dealing with actual with, with elected officials in different communities? What, what's the perspective at this point? Where do they how do they kind of inter, interact or intersect with the movement? Yeah, they're, they're too slow. <laughs> they're mm -hmm. too slow. But, you know, again, the community organizers that we're supporting are really pushing and they're pushing and pushing and pushing. They haven't given up. Right. Even in Atlanta. The mayor hasn't closed down the facility yet. There's like 20 people left in there now in the Atlanta City Detention Center. And we're pushing, continuing to push to close it down. They'll get there, right? And in LA, the Justice LA Coalition mm -hmm. pushed to stop the building of mental health jails, like a $3.5 billion bond measure. Finally, the county supervisors got on board. They passed it right before COVID. And they're, you know, they're still having to push. Like we're on calls really pushing, right? You've got to keep this going. You got to shut these things down. So they're getting there. It just takes time and like Amanda said, the community organizers, I always say, are saving our ass. We just yeah. follow them. Well, it's, it's a really people pushing for change, <laughs> the thing. And this has been the beautiful thing in the last several years is that yeah. people are paying so much attention to their city's police contracts, to their city and county budgets. And so, you know, people are engaged and they're saying, you know, like, no, let's let's really stop and take a look at this. You feel and, like the cavalry is arriving? 
I mean, that- watching, do you feel like the cavalry is arriving watching these massive, I mean, the, the number of people in the streets uh, earlier this year has to have been the most and probably even more than since Kent State, you know, I mean, it, it, it's the biggest social protest we have seen in the US. I'm guessing probably ever uh, exceeding even even Vietnam as a, as a share of the population. I mean, do you feel as though you know that this is uh, is that a moment around a you know a, a just egregious, unjustifiable outrage, or do you think it is in fact something that is enduring now and will be a, a consistent source of pressure on elected officials as they make these decisions? This has been going on for a very long time. Activists have been in the streets every summer yeah. and they have been offering this vision all along. They've been saying divest, invest, defund, um, you know, and offering this affirmative vision of what we need to build instead. And so it's wonderful that it's getting more traction and that there's more momentum, but this has been a very consistent building by activists locally. Uh, YouTube, uh, maybe Deanna, this would be good if, if for either of you, a question from YouTube that really goes to what I was just asking. Um, how do we talk to people who are stuck in old ways of thinking on this issue uh, or resistant to change? What have you found to be successful talking points or, approach in, or approaches to this segment of society? Good question. Well, my, my approach is, is, is actually to use creative practice. I've been able to bring together folks from various sectors, right, who have very different beliefs around imagining and get them using their hands and get them them being creative. It's kind of a, the way that we work. Um, and it helps people to start to see things a little differently. I encourage them, right? Oh, look, you just came up with a new idea. Tell me about that, right? And it puts them just in a different frame of mind. I've seen it work everywhere we go. So that's one way to do it, right? And that's one thing we offer, like, hey, let us come in and let's have a creative visioning session with everybody. We're, we're have, we want to work with everybody, even the people that don't agree with us. Mm-hmm. Amanda, what are your thoughts? Um, say the, the question again. The question was, how do you talk to people who are kind of resistant to this the whole rethinking, who believe that more safety means more police? Yeah, I mean, you know, very similar to, to what Deanna has said. I mean, I think it's involving people in thinking, having them think about what are the spaces where you feel safe? Um, you know, what are the types of things that, you know, in your life have made you feel supported? Um, and trying to figure out how do we build upon that? Um, because I think people have this, you know, felt sense um, of what it means to be safe. And that often does not mean, um, you know, a police or a jail or metal detectors or things like that. So I think helping people to just draw upon what they know of create, uh, that creates safety. Let, let me ask you, let me stick with you for this, this question. I mean, I mean uh, I, I, we've talked about reducing police funding. We haven't really talked about police accountability, which is often the most explosive and volatile of these issues in communities. And there is a perspective that says that the kind of new generation of, of DAs and prosecutors have had more success at changing systems, reducing cash bail, reducing over incarceration, uh, incarcerating fewer people to begin with. They've had more success on that front than they've had on trying to institute greater accountability uh, for police. How would you assess uh, the progress and how critical is it in your mind uh, to have a system in which there can be greater accountability uh, for the improper use of force? So I think unfortunately what happened in the past seven years of protest was that, you know, all of the attention went into reforms. So, I mean, the fact that so much attention was put, you know, put on uh, implicit bias training for police forces, diversifying police forces, body cameras for police forces. What this meant ultimately was that billions of dollars flowed back into the police system, money that should have gone towards mm. building out actual safety. And so I think I worry, and I think my angel put this really well in the previous panel, I worry about all of the talk about reform that really focuses on, you know, we just need to tweak the system or reform it. I really think that the center of gravity in our movement needs to focus on defunding, abolishing, and building something new. Mm. Deanna? I I agree 100, 100%. It's not the building of the prettier version, right? It's the same thing, right? And from the architecture side, right now, most architects are like, oh, we'll solve the problem by making the jail or the prison look real good. Right? Or make it a little bit smaller. I'm like, no, it's got to go. It's got to go. We have to, our system is structurally racist. It's built on the foundations of enslavement. You can't fix that, right? It's a rotten foundation, you know, mm-hmm. and it's not holding anything up. And we see it falling apart. It, it is falling apart. It will fall apart because it's not sustainable. 
and we have to have a, a vision for something new. No. We can do that. We can do that. That is a powerful notion on which to end. I don't know what we could add to that. We're going to have to leave it there. Thank you both, Yana and Amanda, for joining us. Um, thank you, Ron. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for being part of this conversation. Really terrific. Um, and thank to everyone who's tuned in for this conversation. Thanks to the MacArthur Foundation's uh, Safety and Justice Challenge for their support uh, of this uh, program and the many that we've done around the country uh, as part of this series. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. And I guess there's one word that, uh, that applies to everybody. Vote if you have not already. Thank you all. And we'll see you again. Thank you. Thank you.